bom dia a todas e todos. Good morning, everyone. Today, June 11th, year two of COVID-19, we keep dribbling the damage of 15 months locked in our homes and trying to decide if you are more afraid of our death and loved ones or of the anti-democratic wave that threatens Brazil. The payoff we have is this, bring together experts in history and philosophy of biology from distant lands and at no cost, yeah? Uh, a free lunch indeed. Today our guest is the British-born Canadian philosopher of science whose name is almost synonymous with philosophy of biology, Michael Rhodes. Of course, he published outstanding articles in scientific journals, but what is impressive is that he is the author, co-author or editor of, of no less than 56 books, as I could list in the curriculum posted on his website at Florida State University yesterday night. Well, it renders my job easier. I don't need to mention anything but the la latest book that was released a few weeks ago uh, with an inspired title for Pandemic Days. A the title of the book is A Philosopher Looks at Human Beings. From the book, I will mention just one thing that matters most to me the expression, as I understand it, on uses, respect, and even admiration for a thinker who was not at all an evolutionist, let alone a Christian, the great uh, biologist and philosopher of biology, Aristotle. As I mentioned last week, I owe Bob Richards' generosity to model this course the discourse at USP, name it the region species of Charles Darwin. But this year, the, the courage, I may say, to bet on bringing together historians of science and evolutionists, I owe it to Ruse's article on science education 80 years ago, an article called uh, Teaching the Classics, the Origin of Species as a Case Study. So thank you, Professor Roos, uh, for that stimulus, and thank you for your time to share your ideas with our students today. So well, please. thank you very much. Thank you, Maria, for inviting me, and Marcello for doing the work that needs to be done. I am a little surprised. I thought I was going to be paid a million dollars for giving this talk. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was not clear about that. <laughs> Free lunch. <laughs> well, I tell you what, why don't you send Marcello up to Florida and he can work for me for five years for nothing and that will oh, pay it oh. off. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> I think he, he needs to ask uh, the dogs if they yeah, leave. I uh, yes, I was just saying to everybody, I'm a great dog lover. I don't know whether you can see my dog over there. And I've just come in from walking them. So although we've been shut up for 15 months, every morning I do get out in the park and walk my dog. So it's not so bad after all. <laughs> OK, are we ready to start then? Maria? Marcel. Yes, oh, Marcel will put yeah. the screen. Maria, okay. are, we, are, we, are we ready to start now then? Yes, yes. Marcello, Marcello, are you ready will... for me? Okay. Okay. Now I have got a number of slides. I'm going to get Marcello to, you know, bring them up when I say, "Please, next one," and uh, that that will get us. That. Okay. So this is the title of my talk: Charles Darwin and his revolution. And so to take a background, let's say, up until the 19th century, the basic picture was that certainly in the West, certainly in a place like Brazil, uh, was that given in the Bible. 
And the, the Bible gives us a story of origins where the Lord God, next please, Marcello. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, Marcello, next, next, next please. Ah, so here we are. This is Michelangelo's picture of God creating Adam. So as I say, this is the background against which we're putting this lecture. And basically what Charles Darwin is going to do in his revolution is give us an entirely new picture of creation. Now, can I just say one thing before I start? Already, you start to see that Darwin does not come from nowhere. Darwin is drawing on his past, his environment. And of course, one of the pasts, uh, one of his past is Christianity. Charles Darwin was brought up as a Protestant member of the Church of England. So Darwin, in other words, I like to say he's a great revolutionary, but not a rebel. What I mean by this is that nothing in Darwin was invented by him. He took the pieces that he found and like a kaleidoscope, you know, a kaleidoscope where you, you turn the things around. So what Darwin did was twist and put things in a different order. That does not in any sense detract from his genius. So please understand, I'm in no way saying Darwin was not a genius, was not a great revolutionary. I am saying, though, that he got his ideas from his past, and many of these were Christian, starting with the fact that Darwin thought he had to give a story of origins. If you, those of you who remember Plato or Aristotle, or those of you who are Buddhists, will know that there, there's no story of creation because the world always was and the world always will be. In other words, it, it's infinite. There's no start. Whereas in Christianity and, and Judaism and, of course, Islam, you do have a start and then you work. And of course, what you do is you work up to dadam dadam to human beings as, you know, as top dogs, as, I, as an Englishman would say. So in other words, what I'm saying is already we see that Darwin is working, in a sense, within a Christian context, because he thinks the question of origins is not only a real question, but it's a very important question. So please keep that in the back of your mind as we go through this. Darwin is a great revolutionary, but he is not a rebel in the sense of giving up everything that he grew up with. OK, next, please, I tell him. Next. Oh, thank you. So this is Charles Darwin, born in 1809 and died in 1882. He was born on February the 12th, 1809. And those of you who know your American history will know that another important person was born on February 12th, 1809. Abraham Lincoln. So Darwin and Abraham Lincoln are exactly contemporaries. But whereas Abraham Lincoln was born in a log cabin to a, a relatively poor family, Darwin was born to a very rich family. His grandfather, Josiah Wedgwood, was one of the great industrialists of the Victorian or pre-Victorian age. So Darwin grew up very well off. I like to say he was Silicon Valley rich. He had the kind of money that you associate with Jeff Bezos and, and uh all of these sorts of people, people who've got real money, Bill Gates, for instance, uh, and others. And you can even see this. This is a portrait of Darwin uh, painted when he was about 30. And if you look at it, it's a very, very good painting. And the reason why this is a good painting is because it was painted by the best watercolorist in England at the time. So Darwin came from that kind of background. OK, so once again, I stress he's not going to rebel against this. He's not going to say, oh, I give it all up and I'm going to be, you know, like Buddha. I'm just going to walk in, you know, with a begging bowl for the rest of no, 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 no. Darwin was always a very comfortable middle class Englishman. And his theory came out of this. Next, please, my turn. Next. OK, so here we are. Then this is this lays out the basic facts. OK, and this is 
the story that I'm telling you within the context of what I'm telling you. <clears throat> he was born in 1809. He was educated, first of all, at school in England. Then his father was and grandfather were doctors, physicians. And the idea was that Charles Darwin would become a physician like them. And the best medical school in Europe at the time was Edinburgh in Scotland. So Darwin went there for two years. And after two years, he said, I just can't stand this. I mean, apart from everything else, the operations were done without anesthetics. So you would start an operation, say on a child, who'd be until they went unconscious. And Darwin said, you know, I can't, I can't live this kind of life. So then he went to the University of Cambridge in England, intending of all things to become a clergyman. Why a clergyman? Well, because you didn't have to be very clever. You, if you were rich, you didn't have to do a lot of work. And it was a very respectable position. But while he was at Cambridge, Darwin became more and more interested in what we would call biology. Now, he did not do a biology undergraduate because there were no science degrees at all at that time. So he did classics and these sorts of things. And then in 1831, just when he graduated, through one of his professors, who saw that Darwin was really a very clever young man, arranged for him to go on board HMS Beagle, uh, which uh, was going to spend five years going around South America, mapping it. Now, why would an English warship go down there? Well, because at this time, the English were selling their, their goods. They were making them in Manchester and in Birmingham, and they needed markets. And where were the rich markets? Well, you know, they were, they were in South America because South America had been going now, what, three or 400 years with Europeans. And it was, in many respects, very rich. So it was a good market. Now, if you send out a ship from Manchester, say, or from Liverpool with lots of things, what you don't want is for the ship to go get go adrift or get you know upset by because there are rocks or something that you don't know are there so the english were going to go round south america mapping it and producing good maps and darwin got the opportunity to go a ship's naturalist on board hms beagle and that lasted five years now let me just anticipate quickly and then we'll pick up on the beagle again when he, he was he did not become an evolutionist on the trip he became an evolutionist after the trip and i'm going to tell you exactly when and how he discovered his mechanism of natural selection 18 months later at the end of 1838 but for whatever reason one reason is he became very sick darwin did not publish his ideas until 1859 when he published his major work on the origin of species and then what, 12 years later, Darwin wrote a book about us, The Descent of Man. And so these are two, Darwin's two very great books. And then he died at, what, just over the age of 70 in 1882. After his trip around South America, he never left England again. And he got married his first cousin. And so there was more money. And they had, I think, seven or eight children. And they lived a very comfortable life. Okay then, Marcello, let's go on to the next one. Okay, there we are. So this is HMS Beagle, and this is the warship. There would, there would have been about 150 people on this ship. And this is the one that Darwin sailed around South America in. He, he was not a good sailor. He was always, ah, ah, ah. And so as much time as he could, he spent on land, walking around, traveling around, uh, doing geology and these things. I mean, Darwin had the money to do this. He could get off, let's say, in uh, you know, not not Mendoza, but one of the south, <clears throat> one of the South American ports, and then he could afford to hire uh, horses and servants and those sorts of things. And for instance, in Argentina, he went back and forth across the plains. You know, I mean, I, I'm not sure that it was that comfortable, but he was not he was not hard up, so he could afford 
to hire servants and these sorts of things. And so he spent five years doing this. It, it, actually, he wrote a very, very popular book about it uh, at the end of the trip and it became a bestseller. OK, so then he comes home. OK, he comes home in 18, 1836. Now, let's ask about Darwin while he's on the trip. He left Cambridge. He was still thinking about becoming a clergyman. So he left Cambridge as, a, let's say, an Orthodox Christian. I don't mean Eastern Orthodox. I mean a regular Christian. And because he was English, he was a Protestant Christian. So, I mean, he was a perfect. So he believed in God the Creator. He believed in Jesus Christ. He believed uh, that, that Adam and Eve were, in, were created by God and that they sinned, they ate the apple and were expelled and were tainted by original sin. And then Jesus came to die on the cross to save us. And because Jesus died on the cross, we have the possibility of eternal salvation. And Dar I don't know that Darwin thought terribly deeply about this. He always said, you know, he said, I have to talk about religion because a lot of what I do deals with religion. But he said, you know, essentially, I'm not really a religious man. It's, this isn't something which excites me, but much more interested in biology than, than in religion. But he was a conventional Protestant Christian. OK, next, please. Marcello. And so next. So this is the Church of England that Darwin believed in when he left. However, on the voyage, increasingly, he started to doubt the biblical miracles. He started to say, I just really cannot believe that Jesus turned water into wine. <laughs> I mean, that's just ridiculous. Isn't it much more sense to say that Jesus made everybody, hey, be quiet. I've got my dog is my dog doesn't my dog does not approve of evolution. So he's shut me up as I talk. OK, so Darwin, as I say, started to doubt miracles and that sort of thing. And so he became a what is known. Next, please. He became what is known Marcello, next as a deist. That means he still believed in God, but he believed that God had done it all at the beginning and then just let the laws work like this. So no miracles. It just went. All. Now, notice immediately a theory of evolution, which works according to law, is confirmation of deism. It is not. So in other words, being an evolutionist for Darwin was being a religious believer. It supported the kind of God that he believed in. So please, under, again, very interest as you these sorts of things. So you should never think then that Darwin said, oh, I, he was not a new atheist like Richard Dawkins. In fact, I'll mention this at the end of my talk, but understand that Darwin never said, oh, uh, I hate you, God. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna make it all so unpleasant for you. Darwin would never have thought that way. Even if he started to, at the end of his life, he started to dis, disbelieve in the existence of God, but he would never have turned around and said, God, I hate you, or anything like that. That, that wasn't the way that an educated, civilized Englishman behaved. But so as I say, it, by 1836, he was a deist. He believed in God, but a God who is an unmoved mover rather than a God of miracles. So even if you come to something like the resurrection, Darwin would have been much more inclined to say, I don't know whether Jesus rose from the dead. I very much doubt it. But what was important was that the disciples on that Sunday, who had absolutely no reason to feel anything but depressed because their leader had died in an awful way, suddenly said within themselves, our Lord lives. I can feel this. It's wonderful. Our Savior lives. Now, if somebody said, oh, well, this is such a psychology, somebody like Darwin would have said, of course, it's just psychology. But it doesn't mean that it isn't, as it were, a miracle in the important sense, not a miracle in the sense of breaking laws, but a miracle in the sense of what it means, how important it is. So this is this is what I'm saying about this. OK, so now. Darwin 
is starting to look, he makes big collections while he's on the Beagle. And he comes home and he's a rich man. So he, he doesn't have, he doesn't immediately have to start looking for a job. He doesn't have to immediately say, you know, I'm going to go and work at McDonald's and wash dishes. <laughs> you know, Darwin, Darwin had the leisure and comfort to look at his specimens and to work at that. So he was not, not going to be worried about, oh my God, how am I going to pay the rent at the end of the month? That was never an issue. So he starts to look at his specimens. Next, please, my child. And what he finds is that he's looking at the, at the birds and at the various animals that he'd seen on the Galapagos Archipelago. Now, I'm sure you all know where that is. It's off the coast of Ecuador. It now belongs to Ecuador. And in fact, the beagle, when it got to Chile, instead of going back around and back to England that way, the beagle went across the Pacific to New Zealand, to Australia, and then on to South Africa. In fact, it made a quick trip back to Brazil and then went home. So it went all around the world. And when they got to the Galapagos, you can see these islands. The islands are 50 miles apart. They're very close. And Darwin saw, he was told, he said, there are these giant tortoises. There are these little birds, the finches and the mockingbirds. And what is amazing is that on the different islands, they're different species. You can see the different tortoises. And Darwin said, how could that possibly be? It wouldn't make sense for God to have put different ones on different islands. In any case, he was thinking in terms of law. So Darwin said, the only sensible idea is that the tortoises came to one of the islands and then managed to travel to the others. And don't forget, tortoises aren't going to make, you know, a daily trip or a weekly trip. It's only going to be very occasionally that a tortoise is going to get on a, a piece of driftwood or something and make that journey. And he said, when they got to the, the different island, then evolved into the different kinds. So this is how Darwin thought. This was about March of 1837. But notice one very interesting thing. When people talk about evolution, both those people who are in favor of it and those people, particularly those people who are against it, the American creationists, immediately say, ah, the fossil record shows that evolution occurred or the fossil record shows that evolution did not occur. It was not the fossil record that counted for Darwin when he became an evolutionist. I'll show you, he taught the fossil record later, but not at this point. <clears throat> it was geographical distribution. It was how he found <clears throat> the organisms uh, from island to island. And more than this, Darwin said, there are tortoises like this on the mainland in Ecuador and that sort of thing. They're similar, but not quite the same. Makes much more sense. But more than this, Darwin said, look at the birds. Now, birds are like the birds of South America. They are not like the birds of Africa. But if you go to an island, islands off the coast of Africa, let's say Azores, for instance, you find that the birds on the Azores are like the birds in Africa, not like the birds in South America. So the birds in South America, the islands off, off South America, like the Galapagos, have similar birds. The birds in Africa, take islands off the coast, like the Azores, have similar birds. But you don't find them crossing. And Darwin said, it all works by law. The only sensible solution is evolution. So this is what Darwin thought. And so this is the way he thought. He did not use the word evolution then. It wasn't until the 19, 1850s that it started to be used. He talked about descent with modification. I should say the last word of the origin of species is evolved. So when people say, oh, Darwin would use the word evolution. No, but he used the word evolved. So that's just technical. OK, <clears throat> so now Darwin said, what does this mean? Next, please, my child. What does this mean? A tree of life. This is the history. But now notice, again, revolutionary, but not rebel. Darwin was giving a story of origins, just like the Christian would. But 
what was his metaphor? How was he describing the tree of life? And where does the tree of life come from? I'll tell you where it comes from. It comes from Genesis chapter 2. We're told that there's the tree of, 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 of good and evil or knowledge and evil, the one that Adam and Eve took the apple from. But there's also in the Garden of Eden, the tree of life. And so Darwin is using a metaphor from the Bible in order to illustrate or to show how his theory works. Now, understand, I, I'm not saying that Darwin was trying to smuggle God in by using this metaphor. That's, I'm absolutely not saying that. So I'm not saying, oh, well, Darwin was obviously a secret Christian because he used the tree. No, he wasn't. But Darwin grew up as a Christian, was used to this. And when he was thinking about looking for metaphors, of course he would use this. I mean, it's just like me. Oh, uh, just like me and like you, Maria. If you wanted to think of a metaphor for something, I mean, let's say, you know, say some some kind of food that you didn't approve of. I'd be inclined to say, you know, why are you spending your whole life eating Big Macs? Because that's part of my culture. You might have some other fast food that people like. I guess in these days, everything is Mac, McDonald's, but you know what I mean. And you might say, oh, yes, but they like to eat, you know, tacos or something. In other words, it doesn't mean to say I, I'm approving of Big Macs. But what I'm doing is using something in my culture to, as it were, to explain what I'm trying to think about. And this is what Darwin is doing here. He's not smuggling religion in, but he's certainly using religion, as it were, for the metaphors. As I say, revolutionary, not rebel. OK, now, Darwin was at the university, had been at the University of Cambridge. Who was the greatest scientist that had ever lived in England and had been a graduate of the University of Cambridge? Isaac Newton, the great, the, the great physicist, 200 years earlier. But what was Isaac Newton's great achievement? It was not putting the sun at the center. Copernicus did that. It was not making the planets go in ellipses. Kepler did that. It was not making cannonballs go in parabolas. Galileo did that. So what did Newton do? He brought it all together in a theory and gave it a cause, gravitational attraction. He said, any two bodies are going to attract each other by a force inversely square, inversely to, square to the distance between them, a force. So Darwin knew that Newton was the great scientist, that if he wanted to be, as it were, the Newton of biology, what did he have to do? He had to find a force. It wasn't good enough just to be an evolutionist. He had to say, how does evolution work? What drives evolution? And so for 18 months, that's what he did. Again, OK, this wasn't so much Christian, but he was drawing, again, drawing on his background. He'd been a student at Cambridge. He knew the reputation of Newton. He knew why Newton was important. And so immediately, those are the terms that he thought in terms of. I have got to find a, a biological equivalent to Newton's force of gravitation. And he spent 15, 15, 18 months working to this until he discovered natural selection. Next, please, my cello. However, now here's, here it gets really very interesting, and do take big note of this. Again, Darwin's background. Darwin had grown up a Christian. How do, why, what proof? If I say, oh, I don't know whether God exists or not, what's a Christian going to say to you? They're going to say, well, you don't have faith. However, I can give you good reasons to believe in the existence of God. For instance, everything has a cause. Here we are. There must be a cause. God. So that, that, that's known as the cosmological argument. But another, even more famous, and one that Darwin had studied while he was at Cambridge, remember, he was going to be a clergyman, not a biologist. So, of course, he'd done this sort of stuff in class. The big argument for the existence of God 
is the argument from design, or as it's known often, the teleological argument. The I. The I is not something random. It's put together. The eye is like a telescope. Telescopes have telescope makers. Therefore, the eye must have had an eye maker or eye designer. The great optician in the sky, that's the proof. So in other words, Darwin, while he was at Cambridge, had not only focused on the nature of the living world, but the living world as something that works, that functions. Put it this way. If you came into a classroom and there was just chalk scattered all over the floor, you'd say, oh dear, someone knocked a box of chalk onto the floor. You know, let's pick it up. And you say, I say to you, what does it all mean? They say, you'd look at me and say, what do you mean, what does it all mean? It just fell on the floor. But if you came into the room and somebody had written on the blackboard, Maria loves Marcello. Okay, it's written there in, in chalk. Maria loves Marcello. I look at it and say, hmm, that didn't happen by chance. That was somebody, maybe a student or somebody else, <laughs> having a joke or whatever it is. They, it, in other words, Maria loves Marcello, did not get chalked on the blackboard just by chance. There had to be somebody who thought about it and did it. There had to be a designer. And so Darwin looked at the eye. Now, Darwin didn't want a designer of a god who does it by hand but he was looking for a designer who could work through unbroken law. Remember, Darwin has not given up on God at this point. God, Darwin is quite happy to say that God designed the eye, but God did not design the eye by hands-on. He did it through unbroken law. And the question was then, how could God have done this? And this was, so in other words, Darwin is not just looking for a cause of evolution. He's looking for a particular cause. Namely, one that can explain the design-like nature of the, uh, of the living world, or what Aristotle called final causes. Now, Darwin lived, his family came from Shropshire in England. And those of you who know England will know that Shropshire is right in the heart of rural England. It's a big agricultural uh, city. Now, England, at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, had just had an industrial revolution. Cotton being made by machines rather than by hand. Uh, Birmingham making all subtle things with foundries and that sort of thing. Mental had moved from the countryside into the towns and were now living in cities. And what does that mean? There were fewer people out in the countryside, fewer farmers, and more people in the in the cities who needed feeding. So in other words, you had to have a revolution in agriculture in order to support the revolution in industry. And people realized, well, I mean, what sorts of things could you do? Well, fertilizers would be one and crop rotation. But people realized the real key to improved agriculture was breeding selecting and breeding. Next, please, Bartello. And so Darwin saw that what was happening was that people were taking a regular pig and breeding on those which were fatter and fatter and fatter until they looked like this, which, you know, this is, this is a, a walking, you know, this is walking bacon. I mean, this is, you know, this is a pig which gives you lots and lots of bacon, not just very little. So Darwin saw that the key to make, and it's design. You say, I want a pig which will be good for producing bacon. I need to design it. How do I do it? By selecting those which are, you know, better than others and breeding from those. And so Darwin saw that the key to getting design, design in the natural world, was through some kind of selection. But Darwin was a deist, not a theist. So it could not be selection. God saying, okay, I'm going to pick these out like this. Had to be through unbroken law. How could unbroken law drive a natural form of selection? Not just a cause of evolution, but a cause of evolution in the direction of what, what was known as adaptation. Things that work, the hand 
the eye, the nose, all of these things, things that work for an end, have final causes. In 1838, in September, Darwin read a book by another, believe it or not, another Anglican clergyman, Thomas Robert Malthus. And Malthus was worried. There'd been a big population explosion in England. I mean, of course, <coughs> people going into the cities and having lots more children, because if you lived on the if you lived on a farm, then it wasn't necessarily a good idea to have lots of children because you had to wait until your parents died so that you could take over the farm. And you didn't want 10 children all wanting the farm. But you go into the city and you work on machines. And often it was small children who could work on the machines better than grown-ups. They could get underneath the loom and tie things up. So having a large family was a big thing. So the population numbers went up and up and up. Next, please, my child. And Darwin and Balthus said, this is, this, this is what it's like. You get a population explosion. Malthus said, why does God let this happen? There must be some reason why God let this happen. And Malthus said, yes, there is a reason. If we didn't have a spur, we wouldn't do anything. We'd be like, like undergraduates. We'd get up at lunchtime. We'd have lunch. We'd have breakfast. Then we might go to a couple of classes in the afternoon. Then we'd have a supper. Then we'd maybe have a few drinks. And then we'd go and meet our friends at nine o'clock. And, you know, at two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, we might go to bed and start it all over again. Bed at three, up again at noon. I had a daughter who did exactly this. I used to joke she had to major in afternoon studies because she couldn't get up in the morning. And Martha said, God doesn't want this. this. This isn't how God wants people to live. So God said, I've got to have some way of making people get off their butts and work. And a population explosion is this. It means you, you've got to compete with a lot of people in order to fee, feed yourself and feed your family. So in other words, Malthus said the population explosion isn't just by, it's something by God. And Darwin picked up on this. But notice again revolutionary not rebel he's taking this theological idea from malthus and then he says okay there's a population explosion which means not everybody can get through only some will get through and those that get through will be in some way better more adapted than those who don't they'll be cleverer they'll be harder workers they'll be able to live on less food there'll be all of these things and so there will be a natural form of selection, equivalent to artificial selection. But this natural form of selection will make organisms seem as if they were designed. And over time, this will lead to change and evolution. And so at the end of September 1838, Darwin had his mechanism, natural selection. Next, please. And this shows what he was talking about. These are known as Darwin's finches. Of course, they're on the Galapagos archipelago. Now, of course, Darwin didn't go there and say, oh, my goodness, Darwin's finches. I've always been looking for those. No, but they were later called that. And there are different species of Darwin's finches. If you go to the Galapagos, you know, they're everywhere. So you can see them. Now, look at these finches. What is, what is particularly striking about them? I'll tell you. Their beaks are very strong. They've got big, strong beaks. They're not thin beaks. Why are they big, strong beaks? These are for eating cactus. They can eat cactus. There are other Darwin's finches which have very thin beaks. Why do they have thin beaks? Because they can catch insects. They're insectivorous. Now, even Darwin's finches would pick up twigs in their mouths and poke around. They're tool users. Now, what you've got then is different adaptations, all brought about by natural selection. And it leads to the different kinds. It leads to evolution. So this is what Darwin's got in mind with his mechanism. Now, as I said, Darwin, for some reason, 
sat on these ideas for 20 years. He became very sick. We're not quite sure why he became sick, but a recent hypothesis is that he suffered from lactose intolerance. Now, most, well, Westerners can digest milk and cheese and milk products, cream and these things. People in China cannot. I had a student who, as soon as he had a cup of tea with milk in it, started to throw up. Like most, most human beings are lactose intolerant. Why, why not? Because they, the only time, I mean, it doesn't happen when you're a baby because you're drinking your mother's milk. But by the time you're, you're 20, you just can't digest milk. But why not? But you don't need to. Because, you know, if you're living in China or, or um, you know, there's no milk around. But then with agriculture, of course, you start to have cows and sheep and goats and all of, in some places, horses. And so milk becomes available as a resource. And there was a selection for this. And so Westerners, over the last 10,000 years, have become lactose tolerant, whereas places which didn't have the need of this, like China, they're still lactose intolerant. But as always, there were always some people in the West who didn't have the genes for lactose tolerance. There are still people who are lactose intolerant. And at the age of 20, they start to throw up. Uh, okay, sorry. Bi what's the question? Did Darwin have a biological? Give it me again. I'll, I'll answer it. Okay. So, as I say, Darwin was probably lactose intolerant because he wasn't uh, in problems at the age of 20 until he became 20. And then he'd start to throw up. And this is really interesting. So what did Darwin do? He would go to a health spa where he would take cold baths and that sort of thing. And of course, he would not eat a regular diet. He'd eat just gruel and those sorts of things. Feel a huge amount better. And then he'd go home. And we've got, we actually have got his wife's cookbook. And if you look at his wife's cookbook, every other recipe has, it calls for milk or for cream. So of course, Darwin went home, started to eat all these cream dishes. And before you were very long, <laughs> he was sick again. Can the inclusion of the excerpt from Joseph on the frontispiece, uh, I'm only getting part of that. If somebody wants, why don't we wait until later and I'll, I'll answer that when we get to it. Okay, so in other words, but Darwin was very sick, but he wrote his ideas down. And finally, in 1859, why do they call it the theory of evolution? Uh, it's, it is a theory, uh, but let's get into the discussion of that later. I mean, uh, people call it a theory because it is a theory, okay? All right, so in 1859, then, Darwin publishes On the Origin of Species. Next, please. And this is the book that Darwin published. This is a first edition. If you want a copy, you can get one for, oh, I don't know, half a million dollars, probably less. It's, it's what in the book trade they call, it's not a rare book. It's easy to get a copy of. It's just a very expensive book. Anyhow, this is The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection by Charles Darwin, MA, published in 1859. And I should say that Darwin already by this time was a well-known figure. He'd written a very popular travel book, The Voyage of the Beagle, about the time on the, uh, on the Beagle. In, and it was a travel book at a time when people liked travel books. Remember, they didn't have television in those days. They didn't have cinema. So reading was a very popular entertainment. In fact, what they used to do is they get these books often from the, a library. And somebody, the mother, say, would read aloud to the whole family for an hour in the evening. Darwin's wife, every afternoon, used to read to Darwin and others, the children and others, novels, fiction, all of these things. I mean, the fiction was coming out in periodicals, uh, too complex. Uh, let's get to that one. I'll, I'll, I'll speak to Michael B. Hay in a moment. OK, so, yeah, I, 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 I bring those questions up. They'd be good for discussion. But let's, let's finish the story now. So, in other words, people knew about Darwin, so immediately they started to talk about it. Now, before we start to talk about it, 
let's see what did Darwin say in the book itself. Okay, next please, my child. Well, what Darwin did was he said, if you accept evolution through natural selection, not only can you prove the tree of life, but I can explain to you all sorts of things in the life sciences that people couldn't understand before. In other words, Darwin worked rather like a detective works. You walk into the room and there is Maria lying in a pool of blood on the floor with a knife through her heart. Okay. And I'm the detective, Sherlock Holmes. And I go around, I go around, I go around. And finally I say, Marcello, I accuse you of murdering Maria. Now, why would I do that? I say, right, let's think about the reasons why. First of all, Maria knew that you'd been stealing money from the coffee fund. You, there was never enough money for the coffee. It was always going, and Maria had discovered that it was you, Marcello, and she was going to tell everybody. Second, you said, oh no, I couldn't possibly have been doing that. I was off in bed with my mistress at the time. When she was murdered, I was having sex with one of the undergraduates. So don't get, well, it turns out you were not. You were lying. You had, you had sex with the undergraduate in the morning, but in the afternoon when Maria was killed, you were around broken alibi. Uh, Maria was killed by somebody with a left hand. Oh, Mar Marcello, you're left-handed. I mean, it all starts to add up. Now, if I wanted to kill Maria, I don't know what I'd do. Prod, 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 prod. I couldn't, do but Maria was killed with just one blow. But it turns out that you had been in the army, in the special forces, where you learn to kill people with your eyes closed uh, in the pitch dark with one thrust. So in other words, I say, okay, Marcello did it. I can explain broken alibi. I can explain reason for doing it. I can explain way of doing it. I can explain skill of doing it. All of these things taken together. You done it, off you go. Uh, you're, you're under arrest, okay? And that's the way that Darwin worked. So he said, okay, evolution through natural selection. Nobody sees, you see, this is the thing. Nobody saw you put the dagger into Maria. So we've got to work indirectly. But we do, we do that all the time. So nobody sees evolution through natural selection actually occurring, or at least they didn't then. So Darwin said, I've got to give you reasons all the way through the life cycle. He said, Evolution through natural selection. I can explain the activity of the social insects. Why, for instance, and he's got an habit, why do they have these hexagonal cells? And he showed because this is the most efficient way of using the, the wax. It's a, a great adaptation. Next, please. And then he said, let's look now at the, at the fossil record, the trilobite. By the way, you'll, I, I'd like to point out I was the first one in my family to get a, a tattoo. I have a tattoo of a trilobite and my wife wouldn't speak to me for a week after. Anyhow, trilobites. Now, how do those occur? Well, whether they fit they, they down the fossil record. And Darwin said, I can explain to you exactly how the fossil record works, why it starts off with primitive forms and then seems to get more and more sophisticated, evolution through natural selection. Next, please. Geographical distribution that we, next please, Marcello. Geographical distribution that we've seen, uh, go back, go back one, that we've seen, already seen. So I can explain why this occurred. They came to the islands and then split up and they evolved when they went to the different islands. Next, please. Why do you, why are you able to classify things in the way that you do? Why do you put let's say humans in with orangutans rather than humans in with what should we say bald eagles why do you put dogs in with wolves rather than dogs in with i don't know let's say snakes or something like that because of evolution and you classify and so darwin you see already 
a century before Linnaeus had come up with this method of classification and Darwin said, I can explain it, evolution through natural selection. Next, please. Now, something they all knew was, something they all knew was that if you look at the bones of, let's say, of mammals, the front, the front leg, they're different, but they're the same. They twisted. Well, why would the bones of man, of the dog, of bird and whale all be the same, but twisted? Because they started off with a common ancestor and then split as they went for their different adaptations. One is for man is for holding things, dog is for walking, whale is for swimming, bird is for flying. So in other words, evolution through natural selection. Next, please. And finally, particularly, and Darwin was very proud of this, why is it that the embryos of birds, let's say chickens and humans, are the same, but as they develop, they become different? Well, because we are all from the same original organism. And natural selection, when you're in the egg or in, in the womb, natural selection isn't going to do very much, you're just safe. But as you get older and get exposed out into the real world, then natural selection takes over and you start to get evolution and the tree of life takes over. So Darwin said, I cannot show you evolution through natural selection in action, but I can show you, like Marcello stabbed Maria, we didn't see it, but this is why the detective feels confident in arresting you, Marcello, for doing this. He says, all these clues point up to this. And Darwin said, this is exactly the same kind of argument. And so this is the argument that Darwin produced in 1859. Next, please. Now, <clears throat> did anybody take this up and do anything with it? Did so, any of the scientists say, oh yes, this is terrific. Let's use this and do something. Well now, Henry Walter Bates is particularly appropriate for the lecture because a collector, a lepidopterist, he went after butterflies. And where do he do his collecting? Brazil, Brazil, along the Amazon and that sort of thing. So Bates was out there collecting butterflies and these things. Next, please. And Bates said, the remark, I mean, he wasn't the first to see this, but Bates said the remarkable thing is, now look at these, the, it's the top one and the one below. So you've got what, four things and a, a central one. The central one is the thing that they all evolved from, or at least some of them. But now the top one and the, bottom, this, the one underneath, they're completely different species, completely different species. So why would one, uh, what we're seeing up at the top is what, these are the mimics, one, the original, and then another. And they go different ways. One has evolved to look like this kind, and one has evolved to look like this kind. And you get the same thing occurring down here with others. Why do they get so close to look that way? Well, said Bates, it's quite simple. The ones at the bottom, the big predators are birds. The ones at the bottom, the lower level ones, taste nasty. Birds learn very quickly not to eat them because they don't taste very nice. The ones at the top do not taste nasty. So birds are happy to eat them. However, natural selection, those butterflies which by chance look closer to the poisonous ones were those more likely to survive and reproduce than those which didn't. So in other words, if, you know, if you've got Marcello, if you've got somebody, as it were, who looks, you've got two people, and one of them looks a little bit like you, and the other one doesn't look at all like you. Well, the one that doesn't look at all like you is liable to be eaten, and the one which looks like you, because you t you're poisonous, and so that's the way it works. And so, in other words, Bates said, not only are we getting evolution, but we're getting evolution through natural selection. And to, even to this day, it's known as Batesian mimicry. So, as I say, this is why Brazil, in fact, has a bit of a hold on this story. I mean, Brazil's important anyway, because this is where Darwin went on the Beagle Voyage. <clears throat> and this is where he really started into thinking seriously about things like 
geographical distribution and the nature of organisms. And these, I mean, as I say, this was at the beginning. I'm not saying that Darwin went to Brazil and said, oh my goodness, this proves evolution. He didn't. But he did go and he did start to find, he, was, he, he was, came from England, he'd lived a very secluded, comfortable life. And now suddenly, here he is in a, a totally exotic world, completely different, a, a world that he'd never dreamed of. And so it was the big, this was the beginning. And in, the, in his autobiography, uh, not his autobiography, in the, the travel book, The Voyage of the Beagle, Darwin makes a great deal, particularly about, particularly about Brazil and how and it worked. It was, a, it was a revolution in the way that he was thinking. As I say, it didn't make him into an evolutionist. I don't think, even think it made him into a deist. But suddenly it shook him from that comfortable middle class background he had, had up at the age of 21, 22. And he said, oh my God, oh my God, this world is bigger, more exciting, more scary, more beautiful more everything that I had ever dreamed of. And to, this is why Darwin is a genius. He didn't then say, oh, well, I'll go back to the Beagle voyage. I'll go back to the Beagle and have a drink. You know, I don't like this. No, he said, oh my God, this is, can I get more of it? I just, I have to see this. I have to understand. In other words, it sparked him. And so, as I say, I think Brazil, more than Argentina or Chile, not more than the Galapagos. The Galapagos is pretty important. But as I say, I really think that Brazil has a special place in this story, both for Darwin and then, as I say, afterward, for Batesian mimicry. I mean, so I don't, want to, I don't want to make too much of it because there are other things that you can point to which were very important. So I'm not, I'm not denying any of that. But certainly these were all important things. OK, next, please, Marcello. Now, of course, we do know that Darwin's theory was incomplete. I'm not going to talk very much about it this morning uh, because I'm almost finished with my time anyway. But we do know that Darwin's theory was incomplete. He did not have a good theory of heredity. We know that the, a monk, a, a ca Roman Catholic monk in, in uh, well, it, na it was in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It's now in, in, in the Czech side of Czechoslovakia. The Czech Republic. And this is Gregor Mendel, who was working on a theory of heredity. It wasn't discovered, though, until rediscovered until the beginning of the 20th century. And the interesting thing is, I don't think Mendel was working on this to try to plug a hole for Darwin. In fact, Mendel read Darwin's Origin of Species. We've got his copy, and he wrote, writes all in the margin. But he's not saying, oh, I've got the solution to the problem of heredity. What he's saying is, can I? A Roman Catholic monk accepts evolution. He decides he can. Interesting, Darwin and Mendel never met, but there was a big conference in London in 1861 that we know Mendel went to. And it's quite possible that Darwin was there too. Now, they wouldn't have met or anything like that. And of course, Darwin would have been well known, Mendel wouldn't have been. But it's just possible that once in their lives, Mendel and Darwin were in the same room. As I say, it, 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 it doesn't mean anything intellectually, but it's kind of fun to know. So as I say, Mendel was working on this. Darwin didn't have this. OK, next, please. Now, what Darwin does not deal with in the origin is the most interesting, interesting organism of all, Homo sapiens, namely us, or what in those days they used to call the descent of man. But I'm sure today, if he were writing it, he'd call it the descent of humans. OK. and. Darwin hadn't meant to write on it, but then he got prodded into it. And so in 18, 1871, Darwin actually published On the Descent of Man. And in fact, if you look up here, you'll see I've got a whole pile of books. And somewhere I've actually got a copy of, I, I don't know where it is, but I've, the first book I ever bought collecting was a first edition of The Descent of Man. It's, it's not that valuable. It's nothing like as valuable as The Origin of Species. But I, I'm really very glad to have my own personal copy. And so Bart Darwin publishes it. At one level, it's no big surprise. Darwin is not saying, 
oh, humans require something completely different. No, it, you know, it's the same theory, but applied to humans. Next, please. And so basically Darwin said, this is the way it goes. We've got evolution and it leads from the monkeys, not monkeys of a kind that exist today, but monkeys that existed and they've lead up to humans. And this is the way it goes. Okay, next, please. And so very classic sort of stuff. You know, he said, this is how we evolved. We used to have humans. Men used to be the hunters. And next, please. And this, is, this next one is remarkable. And so women had the children. But no, notice, Darwin believed not just in what he called natural selection, but he also believed in something he called sexual selection, where it's the same process, but instead of being selected for being big and strong, it's selected for being sexually attractive. So in other words, you know, if you've got, I mean, it might be that Marcello has lots of children because he's bigger and stronger. And then when he turks up, oh, I can see Roberto. So when he struggles with Roberto, he beats Roberto to shit. And then Marcello goes and had all the offspring. But it might be that Marcello is so much better looking than Roberto that the girls all go for Marcello, even though he's a, a little weedy chap because he's so attractive. And Darwin said, this is the way that it works. And of course, again, revolutionary, but not rebel. Darwin had all the prejudices of the Victorian age about black people. And so this is the hot and top Venus where they've got the women have big, big bums because they're sexually attracted. So as I say, Darwin was a great thinker, but don't ever think that he was, as, as I say, a broke from his society because he didn't. OK. OK, next, please. We're just coming to an end now. All right. What did the religious people have to say about this? Well, Darwin's great supporter, Thomas Henry Huxley, said, you know, this is fine. You can, you know, I mean, Huxley was an agnostic. He did not believe in God. But he said, if you want to believe in God, you know, there's no problem. On the other hand, some of the very conservative church people, next, please. And this is Bishop Wilberforce. Uh, he's the son of William Wilberforce, who is famous in England for the abolition of the slave trade in the British Empire. And this is Bishop Wilberforce of Oxford. And in fact, Huxley and Wilberforce had a famous debate in the year, two years after the origin occurred, where, Hux, where Wilberforce said to Huxley, tell me, Professor Huxley, are you descended from a monkey on your mother's side or your father's side? Everybody laughed. And Huxley got up and said, I would rather be descended from a monkey than from a bishop of the Church of England. <laughs> you know, everybody swooned and laughed. But this is, the, I mean, in fact, by and large, people took over, accepted evolution without much trouble. The people who didn't were the American evangelical fundamentalists. And they were a very distinct, you know, non-typical group uh, who were biblical literalists. By and large, most people by 1870 were not biblical literalists, and they didn't have too much trouble accepting evolution. However, what they were not, go on next, please. They did not become new atheists. This is Richard Dawkins. They did not become new atheists. They did not, they did not say, ah, God exists. He's terrible. A God doesn't exist. He's terrible. He's an awful thing. And Darwin shows it. No, Darwin, for a start, Darwin never did this. He became probably an agnostic. He wasn't sure. But interestingly, Darwin did not lose his faith because of evolution, because he lost his faith because of the theology. Darwin said, my father and my brother, my older brother, neither of them believed in God. Now, Christians say that if you don't have faith, if you don't believe in God, you're going to go to hell. And Darwin said, I can't accept that. He said, my father was just the best human being I ever met. He was a doctor. He said, my father gave so much to other people. He was, he was, you know, a model. And now you turn around and say, because he couldn't accept God, he's going to go to hell. I don't want anything to do with that kind of religious belief. So in other words, Darwin became something, an agnostic, not an atheist, less because of evolution 
and more because of the, the theology and the theological problem. And that was the very, very common pattern that was what was going on. And so to end this, so where did Darwin end up in 1882? Next, please, my child. Westminster Abbey, next to Isaac Newton. Charles Robert Darwin, born 12th of February, 1809, died 19th of April, 1882. And you can still go there. So in other words, Darwin ended up being buried back in the center of the Church of England. As I said to you, revolutionary, not rebel. And next, please, Marcello. And that is the end of my talk. And so, in fact, it normally says that's all. There you go. That's all, folks. That's all, folks. That's yeah, Looney Tunes. It's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, And so that's the end of my talk. Okay. And so, Thank I'm you, gonna, Michael. Okay, Maria? I invite everybody to open the microphone. Plus two. Well, Marcello, I expect for the next talk you'll get somebody else to, to be, be the butt of all my jokes. <laughs> huh? Maria, I be very, very careful when you're in a room on your own with Marcello. Because, <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> now I know that he's a dangerous man. <laughs> um, well, there you go, folks. Um, I hope you can see that the, I, can I just say, th these are such interesting ideas. They're absolutely fascinating. But they're, they're, they're not they're boring. Not boring. They're, 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 it's huge fun, fun to do this. It, it's so interesting. And I hope some of my enthusiasm after 50 years of doing this came across to you. It, it, this is what makes being a, a student, by being a teacher, being an academic, this is what makes it exciting. It's not just learning facts or these sort of things. It's putting them together and then being able to say, oh yes, that makes sense. Yeah, I see now. Now I understand. That's what really counts. And when you find something, you say, where did I get that? You don't say, oh, my God, I got it from my Christian background. You don't say, oh, it must be wrong. You say, yes, I did. Now, what have I done with it? These sorts of things. So that's what, that's what I'm trying to get across to you. Not just the facts, but the way that you can think about these things and how exciting it is when you can put two and two together and make five. Oh. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> Uh, yes, that's wonderful, Michael. Um, I have a list of people here, a list of uh, questions for you, but I will be, I, I will make the first question. Uh, and that is a duty I have, because last week, Bob Richards was here with us. And, uh, Bob uh, Every, yeah, and he told us that you didn't read really Darwin. So what do you have to say about that? Well, Bob and I are very, very good friends. We've been good friends for over 40 years. I don't think we have ever agreed on anything <laughs> in our whole life. It's like Darwin. Darwin, he lived in a village in Kent and he was his best friend in the village was the local clergyman, the local uh, Anglican clergyman, Church of England. And of course, they would have dinner together, families and these things. And Darwin says at one point, he says, suddenly the clergyman and I found that we agreed with each other. And we looked at each other in astonishment because we never, ever agreed about anything. And so I feel a bit the same way about Bob. <clears throat> I think if I could just talk about this, <clears throat> Bob and I have, <clears throat> excuse me, Bob and I have, let me just take a, a, a mouthful of tea just to get in my throat. Bob and I have two completely different perspectives on Darwin. As you've heard, my perspective on Darwin, which you might expect from an Englishman, is that Darwin was the, what we call the quintessential Englishman. He was very, very English. And so his ideas, I keep saying, revolutionary, not rebel. He got his ideas from his English background. And of course, for Darwin, much of the English background was the, the Church of England and what you believed in the Church of England. So I say that Darwin got a lot of this. He transformed it. Whereas Bob 
is a specialist on German philosophy. A job, Bob works on people like Goethe and Schelling and these sorts of people. So, and von Humboldt. So Bob is much more inclined to see Darwin in the Germanic tradition than I am. So Bob would be much more inclined to say, Darwin is thinking in German sorts of ways. So when it comes to humans, Darwin is not sort of seeing humans emerge from natural selection. That Darwin is more seeing humans as like the end point of a growth. And as it were, human, you start with the acorn and humans are the grown oak tree. So that's the kind of perspective. Now, I mentioned Brazil. And I think here is a point which is really important. You see, Bob, both Bob and I agree that going to Brazil was an incredibly important influence on Darwin, incredibly important spiritually. Spiritual, I'm prepared to use that word. But for me, what I'm saying is Darwin is always trying to put it in the context of his English background. He's trying to think about things how does this how does this make sense? How does this make sense for design? Uh, how does this make sense in these sorts of ways? All the time, Darwin is, is thinking in these terms, even trees of life. Whereas Bob says, no, Darwin goes there as a German romantic, and it's more the whole spiritual experience of nature holistically as a whole. You see, I see Darwin much more as a reductionist, taking bits, things to bits, and then trying to understand them. You know, it's like, it's like trying to understand a, a, an automobile motor. How do you do this? I would say, well, what you do is you get the boat motor out and you start to take it apart. And you look at the different parts, and then as you put it together, you see how they work. Reductionism. Whereas Bob would say, no, the way that Darwin was thinking is much more holistically. Darwin is always thinking about the thing as a whole. So going to the going to the um, the Brazilian jungle for, for Bob says for Darwin was this kind of holistic experience where he suddenly saw it all as one in some sort of way like that. So as I say, Bob and I don't disagree about, for instance, when Darwin discovered natural selection and these sorts of things. But we do have very different perspectives on the kind of theory that he produced. I see him producing a very English Newtonian sort of theory. Mm -hmm. Whereas Bob sees him much more as producing a Germanic, holistic, uh, Goetherian, uh, that sort of overall picture of, of the German thinking. So, as I say, in many respects, Bob and I have very different perspectives. I mean, it, it, at, at, at one level, you know, we, we don't disagree. And we, we're both prepared, you know, to, to join forces and knock down others you know, quite happily. But when it comes to, as it were, the essential, as it were, feeling that's going on here, the kind of which paradigm, if you like, which is the, the you know, the, the gut, the overall root metaphor that we're seeing. I would say Darwin belongs very much in the Newtonian, British, reductionistic, mechanistic perspective. Whereas Bob sees Dar Darwin much more in the German, holistic, romantic sort of perspective. Okay, thank you. I, uh, I will take the opportunity and ask for uh, Jean Philippe Tony asked his question. He he is the last one to put it in the chat, but it, uh, the theme is related to this subject. So, Jean. Yeah, thank you, Michael Roos, for the lecture. Thank you, Marie Lisi. I'm happy to give it to you. How do you pronounce your name? Yo, Joan? Joan Philippe. Yo. <laughs> Felipe, okay. Yeah, Felipe, yeah, Felipe, okay. That's a bit of a, you know, a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? Oh, you are Felipe. I love you. You are so I mean, much easier to say. Oh, Mike, I love you. Go on. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now, a um, short question. If um, Darwin read the um, third critique of Kant, 
the critique of uh, yes, power yes. of judgment? I don't think Darwin did ever read it. Uh, that's, very, that's a very good question. I don't think Darwin read it, but one of his professors, a very important influence in his life, was a man called William Huell. Now, that's a very English name, and it's spelled W-H-E-W-E-L-L. -E -L. So when you see it written down, it looks like Wavell, but it's pronounced <laughs> Huell, okay? So Huell was a specialist in Kant. Huell read German and knew a lot about this. So I think it's really quite plausible, let's put it that way, that at, at times Darwin and and Huell would have talked about some of these things. I mean, Darwin certainly knew the uh, the elements of Kant's philosophy. I mean, I mean, Darwin was an educated Englishman, so of course he would have known these things. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm pretty certain that Darwin had some idea. I, you know, Huell says there will never be a Newton of biology. Huell says nobody can ever explain design like nature of organisms. I think Darwin said, up yours, I am going to show you how I am going to be the Newton of biology. Now, he never actually <laughs> says that, but if, if you were to ask me, I would, I, would, I, would, I would be prepared to put some money on it. I'm not sure how much money, but I'd be prepared to say that either Darwin had been told directly, or at least he picked up a lot of it by osmosis from Huell, yes. So I don't. I certainly don't think Kant is irrelevant here. We know later on when he's writing The Descent, he makes some references to Kant uh, and that sort of thing. So it would, I mean, as I say, Darwin was a very educated Englishman. Now, to be honest, be fair, Darwin would have known an awful lot more about Plato and Aristotle. That would have been, as it were, the basic fare when he was an undergraduate. That would have been the stuff that he would have studied in some detail. So I'm, I'm pretty certain about Darwin's grasp of Plato and Aristotle. I think when you get to the later philosophers, it, it's not quite as a thing. But I, I'm quite sure that if somebody mentioned Descartes to Darwin, he would know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, as I say, because I personally think that that um, I personally think that Huell before Darwin is just about the most interesting writer on this whole problem. He was not an evolutionist. He rejected evolution. But I think the second half of the third critique is, you know, it's a brilliant analysis. I mean, da, Huell, I mean, Kant, you know, Kant is a very, very important philosopher and had a lot of influence. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I will call now, uh, I will read the question made by a student that uh, is asking me uh, to read it for you. Uh, his name is Flavio Ferreira. If you want to open your camera, Flavio. Uh, the question is, uh, good morning, Professor Roos. How did Grant conclude that finches were from different islands if Darwin did not specify the origin of each bird? Thank you. Oh, I see. Oh, I'm fairly certain he did. I think what happened, oh no, I, Darwin, Darwin made extensive collections of birds as well as rocks and things <coughs> from the whole place. And he would send them home. And in those days, they didn't have any qualms about shooting things. Today, if you went to the Galapagos with a gun, you know, they wouldn't let you out of the plane. But, you know, it, it, I mean, you went with a camera, that's a different matter. But going with a gun. But in those days, everybody shot. Now, if, as it happens, <coughs> Interestingly, Darwin says, as a young man, I love shooting. He said, you know, the English shooting in, oh, what is it, August 10th or whatever. And start. Darwin said, I would never, ever have dreamed of missing that. That was so, but by the time he'd spent two or three years on the Beagle, he'd kind of grown older. And he said, you know, it's the shooting as such isn't really what interests me. It's what it means. And so, as I say, Darwin was a rich man. He had servants, and he had a servant do the shooting for him. And what they would then do is, I think they would stuff them because you can't just send them like that. So they would, you know, they would clean them out, just the skins. 
and then they would label them, and then they would send they sent them back to 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 England. So in other words, all the time, whenever he went to some place which had a regular service between them and England, Darwin would make up a package and send them back. As I say, you've got to keep remember this is a guy who can afford to do this. This is a guy, you know, he, he's not going to worry about the cost of postage. In fact, he, not only is he not going to worry about the cost of postage, he's going to get somebody to do it for him. He's going to, you know, he's going to take these and say, I'm not going to spend all evening putting these in a box and then going down and queuing at the post office. He's going to say to his servant, OK, here they are, send them back to England. And so when he got home and then already you start to see that Darwin is becoming a very skilled scientist, although Darwin <clears throat> never worked for a living, for, for money. From, right from the beginning, he was respected as a good scientist. There, there was never, I mean, he got the right connections, but he'd done this time, and he clearly was coming on strong. So nobody ever doubted that Darwin was, was pretty good. So when Darwin turned to people and said, I've made all these collections, would you, would you like to look at them and, and examine them? By and large, they said, I'd love to. What a wonderful opportunity. So Darwin gives these birds over to what John Gould, as it were, who looks at them, and they were all labelled. And so the interesting thing, of course, was that Gould came back to Darwin and said, yes, you've got the... Actually, I think it wasn't the finches, it was the mockingbirds that was really important. And Gould said, without any doubt, these are different species. These are not the same species. And that was the, that was the moment for Darwin. Suddenly, he realized that on the different islands, these different birds were different species. They weren't just variations like, you know, I mean, I'm looking at pictures of you and there's variations in you all. I won't go into too much detail, but let, I'm looking at Louise, Louis, as it were. You know, Louis has a lot of hair. He's, so there's a variation. I'm looking at Marcello or Roberto, and I would not say these are men with a lot of hair. So there's always variations, but I don't think that Louis or Louise and Marcello and Roberto are different species. I suspect you're all humans. Well, perhaps not Marcello, but anyhow, the rest of you, all human beings. So, so you're all in the same thing. And so Darwin came back and thought the mockingbirds were really like the difference was between Lewis with, with a big head of hair and Marcello with, you know, I won't say he's bald yet, but, you know, <laughs> it's, he, he's not over endowed with, with hair. Okay? But, so Darwin said, yeah, they're the same speech. And John Gould looked at them and said, oh, no, 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 definitely. Lewis, Enrique, as it were, represents one species and Marcello represents another species. They, yeah, there's, they're close, but, you know, with no cigar. They're not the same. And that was the moment that Darwin said, ah, why on earth? And don't forget, Darwin is still religious. So he still thinks that God is doing things, but doing it through unbroken law. And Darwin looks at it and says, why on earth would God have put these different species on different islands? And remember, he's also thinking of them as being similar to the ones in South America but completely different to the ones in Africa. And Darwin says, yeah, God wasn't stupid. This, you know, this wasn't a mistake. It wasn't, you know, God is not an undergraduate who's not done enough studying for the exam. Darwin, you know, Darwin said, there's only one solution. But remember, becoming an evolutionist for Darwin was not giving up on God. It was affirming the existence of God. So it was not in any sense a move away from a religious perspective. It was just part of the newer perspective, which incidentally was also known to Darwin. His family were drawn that way. So, you know, as I say, nothing new in that sense. But good question. Thank you. Uh, I will call Pedro Navarro. Do you want to make your question, Pedro? If you can hear me, I can do it. Yes, yes, we can. Okay. Um, Mr. Roos, I haven't read yet the Beagle notebooks, and I wanted to know if Darwin had the insight about the tortoises 
on site in the islands or after he came back to London and started thinking about it? Because the, the mockingbird was after, right? Gould made the observations and he started thinking about it. The tortoises, I don't know if you could explain it to me, please. Well, what I would explain is I don't think, everybody thinks that Darwin was a nice, friendly man who was sick with a big family and friendly. Darwin was tremendously ambitious. He really, I mean, he didn't want to become a politician or anything like that. He didn't, I don't think he particularly wanted, you know, being a big person in the societies or anything like that. But he was very ambitious to be an absolutely top scientist. It didn't happen by chance. And I think, I mean, the guy spent five years going around the world. I mean, the guy has spent, I mean, he, you know, he comes back with a, an understanding and a knowledge that virt nobody else had. I mean, he got this, you know, he got this experience. Uh, uh, and he came back. And I think he was, as it were, championing at, at, uh, at the bit. You know, and as he became an evolution, he knew he couldn't talk about it because it would have been death to talk about, you know, all his mentors were, you know, they, they weren't going to have anything of that. Those, evolution was foreign ideas, Lamarck and that sort of thing. And the English, you, you, you've all heard of Brexit. The English do not like foreigners. The English do not. And any idea like evolution, which is a foreign idea. <laughs> see, <laughs> you see, this is where Bob and I differ, you see, because Bob says, oh, Darwin didn't have any trouble about accepting the romantic ideas. And I say, <laughs> You forget, Darwin was an Englishman. He has trouble with foreigners. <laughs> and, and so, as I say, I, I really think that Darwin became an evolutionist, but realized he couldn't afford to talk about it, but was still desperately ambitious. But of course, don't forget, he's in a perfect position. He does not have to turn to these people and say, get me a job. I mean, Bates came back and Darwin got him a job a secretary to the Geographical Society. But Bates had got no money. So Darwin got him a job. But then Bates had to spend the rest of his life working for the Geographical Society. He did it. I think he enjoyed doing it. He was happy to do it. But that was a, a full-time occupation, which meant he couldn't do full-time science. You might today want to say, anybody who came up with that mimicry stuff, we should give him a fellowship and let him stay at Oxford or Harvard or wherever it is and get on with the work not in those days. But Darwin was privileged in this way. Darwin didn't have to work, and he didn't. And so he came back, he spent, I think, six months in Cambridge, talking to his mentors, and then he went down to London. And, you know, he, he was independent. But as I say, I don't think there's any question but that Darwin was tremendously ambitious. But again, he'd spent those five years on the Beagle, away from everybody. And I think that always gave Darwin a sense of independence, which he might not have otherwise have had. He'd spent five years on his own, reading, talking, yes, yes. But he'd had to work these things out on his own in a completely different world. And I think that gave Darwin a, a confidence and a way he said, you know, Darwin was used to having to think these things through on his own. Now, he came back into society, he wanted to be part of it, but he was un in no way going to be ruled by that society. Mm -hmm. uh, just to complete the, 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 the theme there, do you think, Michael Roos, that uh, Darwin started to think about evolution in Beagle or just in ah, one? Good, very good question. First of all, his grandfather was an evolutionist, Erasmus Darwin. And we know that as a teenager, Darwin had read that. So he knew about evolution. And then when he went to Edinburgh, one of his teachers was a man called Robert Grant. Not a, he wasn't one of his teachers, but one of the people there in the society. And Grant was an evolutionist, a follower of Lamarck. So Darwin knew about evolutionary ideas when he went on the Beagle Voice. And then Lyle, you see, I don't think when Darwin was a student or even, I don't think evolution was an unknown idea. And people knew about it. It was just that they didn't accept it. So it was not, it was not an idea where somebody would say, 
have you heard about evolution? Evil what? I mean, it, it wasn't like that. People knew about it. As I say, Darwin's grandfather, written. it was just that people said, now, if anything, I think they said, it's a foreign idea. We don't want anything to do with it. Uh, but basically, people said, you see, they didn't have the mechanism. And immediately, particularly people in England, would have said, look, evolution, you can't explain design. So, you know, this was, this was what, this, going back to that question, was, oh, this was Kant's problem. Kant, you know, in the third critique, worries about design. And one of the main reasons, I mean, Darwin, he can't quite open. She can't thinks about evolution and discusses it even <coughs> and says, no, <coughs> excuse me, no, evolution, you've got to explain design. You can't, I mean, Kant said science or Newtonian science cannot explain design. So in a way, evolution isn't just wrong. It's impossible. And of course, as I say, I think that was the challenge that Darwin was thinking about. So as I say, even, oh, the good question which was asked, evolution was not a new idea to Darwin. The idea of accepting evolution, that was another thing. Uh, Maria. Okay. Just, just a minute. Oh, okay. I have, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Professor Nelio Bizo that is here, he's a colleague professor uh, of USP and he is a biologist and historian of biology and uh, oh it's nice to see somebody of my age he specialized I, you know, in the in man all, all these little young people uh, Nelio I mean it's nice to <laughs> how are you <laughs> do you do you well, have to get up you. in the middle of the night like I do <laughs> right. and that, well I wrote you a letter some 30 years ago you may have you certainly you won't uh, remember but I was in England studying Darwin's papers and then I sent you oh, a letter okay. in 1992 I think but anyway thank you okay. very much for that yeah for your speech and uh and uh, as a matter of fact, I have a, a question uh, which is exactly on the same page of he will. He was mentioned the frontispiece of original species, and and I have to thank you for correcting the way I ever I always <laughs> spoke the name of William He will. I I always. Oh, you, oh yeah, you, yeah. Yeah, I know. It's, it's always it's the wrong way, and nobody know, never corrected me. So thank I you know. very much. Anyhow, well, now you know, and you you can put yeah, your exactly. In as a matter of fact, my question refers exactly to the same page of Origin Species in which the name of Hewo is mentioned, and it refers ah, to the yes. second. You know where it comes. Yes, exactly for the. And so I'm, I'm going to ask you, after uh, re, uh, um, hearing you saying that uh, he, 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 he had a strong respect for the Anglican religion and their teachers in Cambridge, and uh, so do you, uh, I'm going to ask you how you interpret the inclusion of Joseph Butler's mention in the frontispiece of the second edition of the original species and they're on. So all the other editions of the original species brings the reference of uh, Joseph Butler's book, Analogy of Religion. And, yes. It, and yes, and so how do you explain this? For the same reason that uh, he included some mentions to the creator in the original species. So you think he was trying to praise more highly the Anglican tradition and the reaction, the bitter reaction that the, the Anglican clergyman of Oxbridge had after uh, knowing his book? Well, I think that's a good question. First of all, Huell, as you know, Darwin quotes Huell on the page opposite the title page in the origin. Darwin, yeah. uh, it's a little bit naughty. But Darwin, and I think Darwin knew exactly what he was doing. Let me just get my copy down. Hold on. Where's a copy? Oh, there's one. Hold on. I see, a, a mesma página. A minha pergunta, eu fiz antes da menção dele ao filósofo, mas é exatamente a mesma página do Origem das Espécies. Ele não acredita em acaso, né? Vai dizer, bom, tem alguma coisa. 
tem um intelligent designer aqui uh, dirigindo o debate. Quero... Ele já falou do Lyle, porque a semana passada o Bob Richards falou Leo. Leo, é. Os e... ingleses Lyle. Enfim, gostei do Will também. So, here we go. I mean, this is the origin of species. Yeah. And as you know, opposite the origin, Darwin quotes, but with regard to the material world, we can at least go far as far as this. We perceive that events are brought about not by insulated interpositions of divine power exerted in each particular case, but by the establishment of general laws. And so Darwin is quoting Huell back, as it were, back on back on him. I don't think I don't think Huell was a deist, but Darwin is using I think it's a little bit naughty, but Darwin's certainly doing that. Now, as you say, in later editions, part of the trouble with later editions, and this is why Darwin scholars usually don't like the later editions, is that Darwin keeps adding stuff. And so by the time you get to the sixth edition, I think it's half as long again. And it's nothing like as good a read. The first edition reads, you know, it's it's well written, it's crisp. By the time you get to the sixth edition, yeah, it's I mean, goodness, it's like a, a, a student's PhD thesis, you know, at the time, you know, and you know perfectly well, a, yeah, you know, a PhD thesis is not ex intended to be any good. It's intended to get through the goddamn exam. <laughs> and I, I get the feeling by the time we get to the sixth edition. All Darwin wants to do is get through the goddamn exam. Uh, so I think when he adds people like Butler and that sort of thing, I don't think he's being insincere. I really don't. I'm not quite, never quite sure how deeply he's thinking about them. I often get the feeling that, oh yeah, somebody mentioned it. I'll just put in a quote and move on as it were. And uh, often I get the feeling that that's what Darwin's doing, that, uh, It might well it might well fit in with what he wants, but it's not really it doesn't you see, for instance, in later editions, Darwin adds Spencer's idea, natural selection or the survival of the fittest. Well, you know, survival of the fittest, he puts it in, but I don't think he's you know, I don't think he thinks about it. I mean the trouble is ever since everybody has said then natural selection is a tautology. The survival of the fittest, who are the fittest? Those that survive. So all natural selection says is those that survive that are those that survive. Well, that again is to use a, a technical term bullshit. I mean, it, you know, and so I, I don't take when people, I don't mean that Darwin's insincere about somebody like, um, I lost you, hold on. I don't mean Darwin's insincere. There we are. I don't think Darwin's insincere about, um, quoting Butler or somebody like that. But I never get the feeling that it really matters that much to him. Uh, that the later editions are basically, you know, okay, you say you'll accept my dissertation, my thesis, but you want these corrections. You know, at that point, you're not going to say to the supervisor or the examiner, oh, I disagree with you about these corrections. You're going to say, yes, of course, really good idea. Let me put them in, you know? get my dissertation accepted. And I get the feeling the first edition is okay. After that, it's downhill a bit. Thank you. Good, thank you. Uh, now I call uh, Bernardo for making his question. Actually, we have discussed my question in the chat for a time. But I will get it to Michael. First, Michael, I want to thank you for all this incredible lesson you gave us. And my question can be a little full, maybe, but it's about the name that we gave to this, the theory of evolution. And there is a little confusion because some people talk like theory is something that's not proven yet. And uh, we were discussing that. So what what are we asking about? What <coughs> excuse me? What's not proven yet, but Bernardo? What what are we well, worrying about? Uh, we were discussing because so in common sense we say like theory is something not proven, but evolution it's already proven for a long time ago. 
So we were discussing more the term. I don't know if it was. Well, <laughs> now let me just, I don't know whether this is addressing your question, <clears throat> but you're right to pick up on the notion of theory. It's something which is always coming up. People saying evolution is a theory, not a fact, or things like that. And of course, part of the problem we've got here is, a, <clears throat> is an ambiguity in the way that words like theory are used. If I say, for instance, I have a theory about the assassination of Kennedy, what I mean is I've got a hypothesis, which probably isn't true, but you know, I've got a theory that it was all, it was all the CIA or, or the FBI who wanted to get, they didn't, they, they didn't like Kennedy because he was a Catholic. And so, you know, now th we use theory in the sense of iffy hypothesis. And I think, but we also use theory in the sense of a scientific theory with laws and trying to prove Newt Newton's theory of gravitational attraction. I mean, that's not an iffy hypothesis. I mean, you know, within its limits, it's well, it's well taken. I know we've got more modern thinking, but in the limits of what it is, it's, it's a good theory. So we, we've got these ambiguities. And I often think that when people say, oh, well, evolution is a theory, not a fact. What they're doing is sliding from the un unambiguous claim that obviously it is a theory of evolution in the sense of a theory of gravitational attraction to it's a theory of Kennedy's assassination, Darwin's theory, and it's not a fact. So, <clears throat> of course, it's, it, in that sense, it's not a fact. In fact, if it's a theory, theories are not facts. Theories are things which you try to explain facts. So I, as I say, <clears throat> I always feel that there's, you know, what, a sleight of hand, the three card trick, as it were, where people are trying to slide across, starting with the unambiguous truth that Darwin's theory is a theory in the sense of a scientific theory and ending with Darwin's theory is a theory in the sense of iffy hypothesis. Now, all I can say is, I mean, a lot of people, I mean, sure, a lot of people today are arguing about the truth of Darwin's, the, or the adequacy of Darwin's theory. I mean, for instance, uh, Sewell Wright, you know, what, 50, 60, 70 years ago, argued that in his balance theory, that genetic drift is a lot more important than we think. Other people like Ronald Fisher disagreed about this. So nobody's denying that there can be, and still are, discussions about the adequacy of Darwin's theory as a theory of evolution. But that's one thing. Nobody's saying, you know, that means Darwin's theory is just an iffy hypothesis. It might be, it, it, I mean, I, I wouldn't even want to say that the theory about phylogistic iffy hypothesis, it's false, but it was, in, in its day, it was a regular scientific theory as opposed to, you know, the reason why Kennedy was shot was because the FBI contained a lot of Protestants and they didn't like a Catholic. So, you know, and that's the sort of thing. So that's how I, I would, you know, go at these sorts of issues. Tell me, I'm looking at your second name, Quinteo. Does that mean you're Bernardo the Fifth or something like that? Oh, got missed you. Okay, go on. Yeah, no, Quintao. Oh, okay. Go on, Bernardo. Anyhow, go on, let's move no, on. Okay. It's okay. Um, I'm going to ask now Jean Gabriel, that is with um, the hand there. Oh, yeah. I got you um, in the middle of my screen. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, yes. So, uh, uh, Professor Roos, I would like to first to uh, thank you for this delightful lecture. I left a lot already. Um, I'm really enjoying this. And I would like to make a question. Um, I was wondering how uh, how it all began, this idea of making a book with uh, uh, Professor uh, Richards, since uh, I have to admit that it's not quite common to see um, different points of view in science turning into books. I mean, it, <laughs> it usually ends a lot worse than that. <laughs> so I, I would like to know how how are you how, how was it how uh, was it possible to bring both uh, points of view in, a same, in the same work? Well, I, I think there's a couple of answers to that. <clears throat> One was 
that Bob and I are very old friends, and we've argued this for a long time. I mean, it didn't, it didn't just happen 10 minutes before we started the book. And I think we both felt that Darwin's studies over the last, let's say, 50 years, since, you know, when I started, but, but even before I started, when people started to go to the archives, and Lelio will back me up on this, people started to go to the archives and spend time looking through the notebooks and the letters. Of course, now most of these are online. You, you don't have to go to the archives anymore. They're online. But uh, in those days, you had to. And I think we put in 50 years of hard work trying to understand the basic things. And I think Bob and I felt that we get, it's almost like time to pull back a bit, as it were, <clears throat> and say, OK, what have we got? And we felt, and I think it's right, that we were representing two very different perspectives on evolution or Darwinism. Uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I suspect, without everybody agreeing with me, I suspect my position is, is more common. I don't, that doesn't mean to say it's right, but it does. I would think there's probably my position is more common, but there are certainly people who empathize, let's, let's use that word, with, with Bob's position. And so I think we felt that it was time then to see if we couldn't lay out our differences so that the reader coming along would then have, as it were, something to grasp onto. And we, I mean, we felt that it was an important question that needed to be addressed. And uh, I think the world's going to show I'm right. He's convinced the world's going to show he's right. But as, as I say, that's what happened. The other thing is, Bob, don't forget Bob's at the University of Chicago. Uh, this is a University of Chicago press. Bob has a lot of influence at the University of Chicago Press. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, if Bob says I think this is a good idea, uh, the University of Chicago it. Press tends to say yes, we think it is too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I mean, so to be fair, we can only do that because we've done a lot of hard work first. I mean, it wasn't just that Bob could do this and go to them and out of the blue. Somebody doing it out of the blue would get nowhere. I mean, Bob has done, as I have, has done a lot of hard work to get where we are. So uh, it, the, the, the presses, you know, aren't insensitive to that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, Gabriel Vastus, do you want to make your question? Um, yes, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Professor Ruse, for the class. Really, really amazing. Um, my question is more familiar, maybe. We often heard, and I even watched it in a movie, that Darwin's relation with his wife was um, troubled somehow by his ideas on, on evolution. Um, is, this, is it true, or is it just a you know, legend? Well, I don't think there's ever <clears throat> any question that Darwin and his wife were always on the same side. I think that their relationship was a deep and sincere and very important one. I mean, of course, Darwin was sick a lot of his life, and I think his wife took over the running of it. But I think, you know, at a certain level, that was the kind of relationship they had, where she felt a great satisfaction in looking after him. And I think he felt a great satisfaction in being looked after. So, you know, I think these sort of dynamics, and of course, don't forget, they had many children. But of course, the other thing is, they never had to worry about money. They, you know, they got, and they got a lot of family members. So uh, not just, you know, nieces, brothers, sisters, and they would, we know, they would spend a lot of time traveling but not just traveling, as it were, you know, let's, let's spend a week in Brazil and then go on to Argentina. No, they would, they would go with a family to one of her brothers or something like that and spend a month there. And so Darwin, as I say, it was never, ever a question of dark tensions at that level. Now, at the intellectual level, <clears throat> I think she always, I mean, as, as did, I, mean, I don't think she would, she wasn't pretending, she wasn't like George Eliot, or somebody who wanted to be an intellectual in her own right. We, we know, yes, she was a very sincere, not a Christian, she was a very sincere Unitarian. So, uh, so uh, that meant that for, she did not accept the Trinity. She would go to church, the church across the road from where they lived, 
on Sundays. But when it came to Holy Communion, uh, you know, uh, when it came to that, she would turn her back on it because for her, it was sacrilegious to think that Jesus was God. And the idea, I mean, the, the Church of England don't believe, they don't believe in transubstantiation like Catholics do, but they certainly believe that the bread and the wine have if, at least a very deep symbolic significance. And I think she, she couldn't accept that. So we know that she was a sincere believer, but she was not a Christian. So I think we've always got to be careful about how big a difference there ever was between Darwin and his wife. Uh, I do know, yeah, you're quite right, that Darwin, I think, tried to tread carefully around his wife. He certainly, but it, that was, I mean, that was part of the family. Darwin was not about to, you know, piss her off, if you know what I mean, because he, he relied on her. But he, he didn't want to. It wasn't that kind of relationship. I mean, it would never have occurred to him. But at the same time, I don't think Darwin ever hesitated a moment to put pen to paper about science in a way that he thought was right and proper. He never, he did not consult his wife about that. He did it. People say, oh, well, he put it off or something like that because, you know, he was what, I don't think Darwin ever did that at all. I don't, I'm, you know, I really truly don't. And of course, the interesting thing is she herself admitted that later in life, her religious beliefs were nothing like as strong as they had been when she was younger. So, you know, I don't mean that they were on the same journey together, but I mean, they're all part of the same family. So when Darwin starts to have trouble with religious belief because he can't accept that his father's going to hell, obviously he's going to talk to his wife about that. And she's not going to say, oh, you're completely wrong about that, Charles. She's going to listen. She might feel a little less concerned, but I, I, you know, I just don't think they were on different different paths about that sort of thing. I mean, as I say, you've got to remember, this is a guy who is totally embedded in family I mean, he, from the beginning. And he marries a first cousin. I mean, he, I mean, okay, it keeps the money in the family, but he marries, he's so embedded in family. If you look at, if you look at, um, what is it? Uh, Janet Brown's uh, biology of Darwin, certainly, time they're, they're visiting family <laughs> it, you know they got off to visit, stay a month with her brother and of course they all got enough money so they got lots of room for, for anybody who came with their servants their nannies and that sort of thing so as i say i personally and always you know this whole business of darwin put things off because he didn't want to worry his wife and that sort of thing i i just don't think that's true and i i should add i think an awful lot a lot of darwin scholars would agree 100% with me. I mean, including Bob Richards. I, I, I don't, you know, I think we would all, all say that this was something that, you know, that was was made up by you know, who bore or whatever it is, yeah. Okay. Uh, I would like to return to the question. I will rephrase the question. Uh, uh, in your op opinion, when did Darwin uh, became evolutionist? Was it in well, during the, the end of the video? We, no, we can be pretty certain about this. March 1837. He'd read about evolution as a teenager. He'd thought about evolution or been exposed to it when he was, what, 20 years old at the University of Edinburgh. So we knew all about it. And I'm sure that when he went to Cambridge, I'm sure that some of his professors, particularly Adam Sedgwick, would have told him why evolution is a bad idea. So, you know, so he would have known all about these things. And of course, I don't think at that point he would have felt, you know, a, he wouldn't have had a dog in the fight. I mean, I think he would probably have accepted there wasn't evolution, but it wasn't, as I say, but I think going on that Beagle voyage was tremendously important psychologically. He spent five years away on his own. I mean, I don't mean he was lonely or anything because he was getting letters. He was there with, you know, Fitzroy and the others. So, I mean, that, that wasn't the issue. But he was there on his own, away from all of his mentors, his teachers, these sort of things. Getting the books, getting letters. But I think basically, and, but he had to think for himself. And of course, don't forget, as I've emphasized many times in this talk, 
he was finding the whole experience absolutely mind-blowing going to that Brazilian jungle. And then when he went out on the Argentinian plains and rode around and met the gauchos and that sort of thing and saw how every night they would kill another cow for, for supper, as it were. I mean, boy, he never, you know, this was, and then they, they, went, to, they went to Tierra del Fuego and they saw the savages. I mean, this was absolutely mind-blowing. Then he goes to Chile and there's this bloody great big earthquake. I mean, you know, so, as I say, I think that by the time Darwin came back, he was a way, way more independent thinker than anybody else of his age. I mean, this is one of the things about Darwin. I think he's certainly a genius, but boy, was he ever lucky the way that the, the cards fell in his favor, if you know what I mean. He, he came from Shropshire, so he knew about agriculture. He knew about breeding. He went to Cambridge, so he knew about the argument from design. Yeah, his grandfather was an evolutionist. He had the money not to have to go out and work. All of these things. Uh, you know, so, as I say, at one level, he was about as lucky. Uh, Bernard Williams calls it moral luck. He was about as lucky as you could be. But at another level, you know, he had the, the gum to put it all together, and he did. Okay, thank you. I think Pedro Navarro wants to ask a question too. Again? Yes. Um, um, Professor Roos, where do you take uh, from where do you take such a hard date, March 1837? Is it from the opening of the B note book? Or yeah. is there, I don't know. Well, I think it's about that, isn't it? And we know. Uh, that he'd given the he'd given the the things to John Gould to to study, and so you know it was only about this point that he was still, as I understand it. I mean, I'd have to go back and you know I reread Janet Brown or something like that to get the exact moment. I'd, uh, but he it was only about then that he was starting to get the results in from John Gould, and of course, we know that those were terribly important. That suddenly Gould says it's not like you know Lewis and Marcello you know, look different, but they're the same species. It's, you know, these really are different species. And at that point, boom, my God. Oh my, oh my God. <laughs> you know, how could, and of course, don't forget, it wasn't a new hypothesis. So he knew about it. The question is, at, at that point, at some point, he suddenly said, you know, oh my F God, you know, if evolution's true. And I, I, I think the interesting thing, Pedro, is, is, is from that moment on, Darwin never, ever had a moment's hesitation that this was the case. You, you don't find six months of worrying, well, maybe it's not so, maybe it is. I think as soon as he got it, you, you know, I think, again, this goes back to me, Darwin was hellishly ambitious, hellishly ambitious, Ind ambitious, but independent because of this legal voice. And so I, at one level, I don't find that surprising, nor do I find the fact surprising that he said, okay, I've got this, now I've got to find a cause. He would, you know, the training he'd had, he, he wanted to be the Newton of biology. And to be the Newton of biology, he had to find the biological equivalent of the, um, the biological equivalent of Newtonian gravitational theory. I mean, going back to what we've said about <clears throat> the third critique, I'd be very surprised if before he went on the Beagle voyage, Huell hadn't said something to Darwin about that, not just to Darwin, but to the others. I mean, they all knew about Paley. I mean, they all were against evolution, but I, I, I found it very, very improbable that Huell had never, ever said, well, of course, you know, Kant worries about this issue, and, and you know, blah, 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 blah. I mean, Huell talked nonstop. Of course he talked about it. Okay. So, thank you. Uh, thank you. I, <laughs> Uh, I need to finish even because uh, Michael Roos is talking with us from two hours now. <laughs> so I'm very pleased, Michael, to have you with us. Uh, I hope someday I can pay you that million dollars because it is worst. <laughs> and uh, I hope to meet you again in a better moment. Well, our health. well it has. It has been a lot of fun talking to you. Uh, Louis, Louis, I, I'm still interested. Why uh, do you have a, have you shaven off your beard and nobody else? 
Are you hoping to be a university administrator rather than a teacher? Are you going to be a dean or something like that and wear a tie and a jacket? <laughs> or or is, is, is it just that you can't grow a beard? <laughs> it is the second second choice. I cannot go to uh, <laughs> well to cut my hair. Say, you've got you've got the hair. So there we are. Listen, folks, it's been okay. a lot of fun. As I say, it's it's tremendously important. But don't at a certain level take it seriously. But take it seriously in the right sense. It's not something. It's not a funeral. It's not something where you smile. And it's not serious. You can smile and joke and be very serious. And that, that's one of the reasons why I like working with, with Bob Richards, is that both of us, you know, are willing to tease each other to play these games because we know that we know what we're doing, you know, we're comfortable about it. So always keep that in mind. Take it seriously. But you know, if you never have a laugh or you never 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 can make a joke, and particularly if you're a teacher. You'll learn, I mean, and Maria will tell you, a good joke is worth 10 arguments at times. So keep that in mind, okay? It's been great talking to you. It, and and I, if I say it's a privilege, I really mean that. I don't sound like I'm humble, but I do my best. Okay, goodbye, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Goodbye. Have a nice goodbye. weekend. Bye, everybody. Till next week. Friday will be here. So, ciao, ciao.